All right, Proverbs chapter 12. Let's dig right in here. Verse number 1. The Bible reads, Whoso loveth instruction loveth knowledge, but he that hateth reproof is brutish. Now, I was just... Uh, last week I was interviewed by a, by a reporter from the, from the Sacramento Bee in, in Sacramento about the Red Hot Preaching Conference that's coming up this week. And, um, you know, a lot of people who aren't very familiar with, with church, especially with like Baptist churches and independent fundamental Baptist churches, you know, the, the, the red hot preaching conference, right? The hard preaching is something that seems very foreign to people these days. It's something that they don't even get. So I was trying to explain it. It was, it was, it was a decent conversation, but I know the way journalism works. You know, they want to, they'll talk to you all real nice and stuff because they want to get you to say everything and, you know, and get, get whatever it is that they want out of you to, to throw up as a big headline and, and something so shocking and, and misrepresent the things that you say. Now, I'm not saying this person did that, but in general, that's what happens, right? So you may feel like you're having some great, meaningful conversation with the person and then they're going to turn around and, and, and completely misrepresent your cause. But when I was, regardless of that aspect, when I was speaking to this person, I was trying to explain, you know, the purpose behind the hard preaching. You know, it's called hard preaching. Why is it called hard preaching? It's hard because it's hard. So for a lot of people, it could be, you know, hard to accept or hard to face. It's just preaching hard on sins, you know, on sins in your life that, that you know, we want to hate sin. We want to get it out. We want to get rid of it. So it needs to be dealt with harshly. Right? And that's the point. And it, and it lines up perfectly here with verse number one. It says, Whoso loveth instruction loveth knowledge. And what is instruction? It's being told what to do. It's you know, being said, this is right. You follow these steps. You do A, B, C, D. And, and that is your instructions. See, God has given us instructions on how we ought to live our life. This is what you need to do. If you want to live a godly life, you want to live a righteous life, do this, do this, do this, do this. That's instructions, right? And if you, if you love those instructions as opposed to people who say, I don't want to hear anything. God, I want you to tell me what to do. I want to do my own thing, you know. Well, if you hate reproof, the Bible says you're brutish. And reproof means when you're being told you're wrong. When someone tries to correct you, when you are, when you are given reproof, <laughs> You're being shown that you're in error. And if you hate that, the Bible says you're brutish. And brutish is just an older word that means stupid. Okay, you're dumb. If you, if you don't accept being corrected, being reproved, being explained and told that you're wrong, you're not wise. That's not a smart thing. Hey, if you love instruction, then you love knowledge. You love knowing more and understanding more and doing what's right. And you know, that's why I believe the people that are here tonight and on Sunday are here because they love knowledge. They love the instruction. We want to know. And this is why I tried to explain to the, to the reporters that, you know, people look at this and they think, oh, you're so mean and oh, how can you preach like that? And how do you say that? But that's not it at all. Actually, you know, when I'm wrong with God, when I'm wrong about something, I want to know about it. If I'm living a way that's not pleasing in God's eyes, I don't want to ignorantly just continue down that path and continue to make God upset and make God angry with me and have to be punished and chastised for doing things that are wrong that God doesn't want me to do. I'd rather find out about it right up front. Just let me know about it because I want to do what's right. I have a desire and a heart to serve God, to do what's right in the eyes of the Lord. And the only way we're going to get that is from instruction from his word. So when I say, you know, instruction and being told what to do, it's not that you have to be told what Pastor Burzens tells you to do. If it's my own opinion, it doesn't really matter. And that's not, I try to completely avoid just giving you my own rules or, or what, what I think as much as just Here's what the Bible says. You know, here's God's instructions for us. My instructions mean nothing. What God's instructions is what matters. And when we see things in the Scripture and the Bible telling us how to live and what to do, if you're wise, if you love knowledge, you're going you're gonna to adhere to that. And, you know, that's just a little bit of an explanation. This verse encapsulates it perfectly on why I preach the way that I do inside, in this church. Because oftentimes, you know... Oftentimes we have a tendency, we were talking about this when we were going out soul winning, you could hear some preaching and if it's not very specific, if it's real general, 
If it's just kind of this real generic concept, like we were talking about before, I was talking about you know preaching on hypocrisy. Well, everyone's got hypocrisy to some degree, to some level. You know, and you could say, well, hypocrisy is bad. You shouldn't be a hypocrite. Okay, but how does that really apply? You know, everyone could just say, yeah, that's right. You shouldn't be a hypocrite. But unless you start getting real specific, you know, people might not realize areas where they are being a hypocrite, areas where they where it does apply to them. You know, these these real broad you know terms. Well, you shouldn't sin. Okay, yeah, we all know that. I want to be pointed out where I am in sin, where I am in error. And that needs to be just get very specific oftentimes from the pulpit, you know, where the, the preacher, one of the jobs of the pastors is to teach and to preach God's word and to give the understanding of God's word. You know, we all can read. We all have the Bible, yet God still has ordained a, a minister or a pastor, an elder, in order to help the people get some more understanding of the words. Otherwise, why would he have someone in that office, right? There, there's obviously a lot of jobs involved, but one of them was, is teaching God's word and to give the instruction and the meaning thereof. We ought to love receiving that instruction and not bristle when, when something you know, comes our way that, that applies to us. Because your first reaction, usually when someone tells you you're wrong, no, I'm not. <laughs> right? I mean, that's, that is just like an instinct. And you, you're going to dig your feet and say, like, I, no way am I wrong about this. I'm, 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 you know, I feel like I'm getting attacked, so I'm going to go on the defense. But if you're being reproved from God's word, if you're being rebuked, you got to understand it's not an attack. It's instruction. Okay? It, it's not that, uh, you know... It's not that I hate you. Let's say I preach on something and you're just guilty of it. It's not that I hate you. It's not that I'm trying to attack you. I'm actually trying to help. And in many cases, I might not even know that you know, this is an area that you're struggling with or you have a hard time with. So the, the worst attitude to have is to just to close up, get defensive, and say, no, I'm right. And you know, that's the attitude we saw from King Saul. No. I did, I did what God wanted me to do. I did everything right. After Samuel already said, look, you didn't obey God. What is this bleeding I hear in my ears? You know, wh why do I hear the sheep? What's up with King Agag? Wh why didn't you do what, what God told you to do? And he's like, no, I did do it. I did do what was right. And he just had that stubborn heart. He didn't love instruction and he didn't love knowledge. And let's not be like this all. But let's, so as we go through this, keep that in mind. It's a great verse. Let's keep that in mind as we continue on through here because there's, there's plenty more, um, more specific areas now we're going to get into. And we're kind of getting this in verse number one. Hey, look, if you love instruction, you're going to love knowledge. But you basically, you're stupid if you're, not, if you're going to hate being corrected, if you're going to hate the reproof. Look at verse number two. A good man obtaineth favor of the Lord, but a man of wicked devices will he condemn. Now, who doesn't want to be in good favor with the Lord, right? I mean, I want to be on God's good side all the time. For one, we know that God has blessings. And I say, hey, God's able of doing anything. I want to be the good son. I want God to look down on me and be like, wow, I'm really happy with what you're doing, right? I mean, of course, who doesn't? No one wants to be on his bad side and being just, you know, inches away from just getting the, getting the belt, so to speak. Now, even though it may seem hard sometimes to do what is right, right, making the right choices, being the good man, right, the good man that's going to obtain the favor of the Lord when you, when you make the right choices. It's not always the easy choice. Usually the wrong choice is the easy choice. The quick, easy choice to, to, in any situation is usually going to be the wrong choice. But you can take comfort, even though you may be doing something that feels hard, that, that's causing extra stress, take comfort and have joy knowing that you're in good standing with God. Knowing that you're maintaining the integrity to God in the difficult times. And, and this, is, this is a great encouragement to just say, hey, a good man obtains favor of the Lord. God will be happy with me. And that means more to me than the people that I might make upset by making the right choice. Is, is God being happy with me? And you've got to ask yourself that question many, many times. Is Do I care more about how these people might think about me? Or do I care more about how God thinks about me? A lot of other people, they might be really happy with you if you were to, in one way or another, deny Jesus or reject God's word or say, oh, I don't really believe that. Well, what do you think about that? What about when the Bible says this? Yeah, I don't really believe, you know, 
You might make them happy, but you're not making God happy when you're, when you're denying his word, when you're saying, I don't, you know, I don't believe God's word. And you're calling him a liar, you're actually making him, him very angry. And we need to keep that in mind when you, when you may get pressured, you may get stressed, you may get you know, these outside influences being attacked, being persecuted, however it may come, you know, to just do what's right and know that you're obtaining favor of the Lord. Let's keep reading here. Verse number three. A man shall not be established by wickedness, but the root of the righteous shall not be moved. Doing what's right. I mean, that's, you'll be rooted down. The Bible's saying you will not be moved. That is a great foundation to be settled on. Look at verse number four. A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. Now, I just preached on husbands loving their wives on Sunday morning. Now, we're gonna, I'm going to actually spend a little bit of time here focusing in on this verse that's, that's aimed more towards the wives. We spent a lot of time on how the husband ought to love his wife, you know, not be bitter against them, and, and that was the entire sermon on Sunday morning. But in order to have a good marriage, you, know, you, you both have to be doing what you're supposed to be doing. So yes, the husband, they need to be making sure that they're loving their wives, that they're doing everything that God told them to do, they're providing for them, you know, giving honor unto them as unto the weaker vessel. I preached all that on Sunday morning. But if you want your marriage to work, you need to take up your own role. If you're a husband, you take up the husband's role. If you're a wife, you take up the wife's role. And what the Bible's saying here is that a virtuous woman, a woman who's doing well, a, a great wife, someone who's a virtuous woman and doing what's right, doing what's virtuous, is a crown to her husband. Right? And what's a, what's a crown? It's, 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 it's something that your husband can rejoice in and say, wow, I have this great wife, and, and she's, you know, it's, it's so attractive, it's so great. I, I like going around in public letting everybody know that this is my wife, right? That's what a crown is. You're, you're kind of able to show off, hey, this is, you know, not proudly, but you know what I mean. Just, just this is a great wife. A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. It's a good aspect. It's a, it's a, you know, it's, it's a very good thing. But she that maketh ashamed, think about this, is as rottenness in his bones. Think about, I mean, that is a very graphic description. And, and let that sink in, ladies. I mean, I'm sure you don't want to be a wife that to your husband, he feels like his bones are just rotting because of how you are as a wife. Because you are a shame. Because you are not being a virtuous woman. You are not being a virtuous wife. The husband now has to, you know, hey, and does that make it right then for the husband not to love his wife? Absolutely not. He has his job and his role from God. He needs to love his wife no matter what. And if that happens to be the case, if she is ashamed and it's like rottenness to his bones, he still needs to love her. But ladies, you want your, your husband to love you? Make it easier on him. Right? Don't be rottenness to his bones. You want to be the help and be that glory and be that crown for him, not to make him you know, th that rottenness and make it hard for your husband to love you. Now, there's many ways for a wife to make a husband ashamed. The first thing that comes to mind just when, when I see the word ashamed, all throughout the Bible, shame is associated with nakedness. And, um, you know, for a woman, a wife that's dressing immodestly, that can cause a husband to be ashamed, right? You come to church and, and, and the wife's dressed immodestly. Well, that's a shame. And that's going to be like, man, you know, I wish you wouldn't do that. You know, and and uh, you know, husbands, if it's that bad, you need to take charge and say, you know what? You're going to wear something different. Okay, as far as the modesty goes. And being the leader and being the ruler in your house, saying, this is going to stop. But some, some people these days, they glory in their shame. You know, the, even the husbands that, that they have these, you know, trophy wives and they, they get these women just to show them off, show off their body for other men to look at, which I don't understand. I've never understood that. Why would you want other men, you know, lusting after your wife? It, it's wickedness. It's disgusting. And I, I, I mean, I, I never want men looking at my wife. I don't know. About you. I'm very protective of my wife. I'm very jealous over my wife. With a godly jealousy, and just so you know, that word is used incorrectly many times today, but the Bible says that God is jealous, and there's nothing wrong with, with not wanting your spouse to look at anyone else 
or for anyone else looking at them. You know, the reason why God is jealous is because it was explained with not having any other gods before him because your God's a jealous God. See, God doesn't want you looking to these idols and looking at these false gods and giving them the honor and the respect that only belongs unto God. He says, that makes me angry. That makes me jealous. The same way with my wife. I don't want her looking at any other man as if the way that she ought to be looking at me. And you know what way I'm talking about in, in, in that type of a, of a loving way or whatever it is that it should only be between a man and a wife where she's looking at someone else. That's going to make me angry. That's going to make me jealous. And yes, that is not a bad trait to have at all. But that would also be something that would make me ashamed. How much of a shame would that be if my wife and I go out somewhere, maybe we go to a party, a birthday party or some other gathering, and she's like gawking over another man. And talking, or, or even just talking about some celebrity, right? Women do that these days. They say, oh, have you seen this and such and such show and this actor? And isn't he so hot and everything else? That's a shame. You know, that would be like rottenness in my bones if my wife were to go out and just start talking about some other men that she thinks are so attractive and so good looking and, and oh, to spend one night with it. You know, it's, it's wicked, it's disgusting, and that's a shame. And that's something that women can do. That would be rottenness in, you know, for, in her husband's bones. Or being a tattler, being a busybody. The Bible talks a lot about that. You know, you want to be able to, you don't want to be as a husband. Husbands don't want to be looked on as, oh yeah, he's bringing his wife. Yeah, she just goes around and gets involved in everybody's business. Because being a tattler and, and being a busybody is something that's usually well known among people because you can't keep your mouth shut and you're going around and just spreading gossip and rumors about everybody else. And it just becomes known that that's who you are. And that brings a reproach upon your husband. Being loud, being stubborn, right? The, the exact opposite of what the Bible describes in many areas about how a, a, a feminine woman ought to be, a virtuous woman. When you're just, just, just real loud and obnoxious and stubborn and nobody can tell you anything, that is also something that can cause um, your husband to be ashamed. Or how about this one, being disrespectful, and disobedient to your husband. The Bible says in Ephesians 5 that, you know, the husband is to, um, that you're to obey your husband in all things. Even as Christ, as, even as the church is subject unto Christ, so shall the wives be unto their husbands in everything, in all things. That's this level of subjection and obedience that a wife is called to, according to the Bible. So when a wife completely disregards that, disregards her husband's God-given authority in the house, and just starts becoming very disobedient and speaking disrespectfully and talking to you like maybe as, as, a, as a, you know, wives that, that talk to their children and scold and rebuke their children, when you start talking to your husband as a child, that is extremely disrespectful. And that ought to be not to be tolerated. And I'll tell you what, ladies, when you talk like that to your husband... It's like rottenness in his bones. It's a shame. And especially in public. You go out and you, you, know, you start talking bad. And look, I don't think any spouse should ever be talking bad about their spouse, husband or wife. You never ought to be bad-mouthing your spouse. It is, it is toxic for your relationship. You need to be looking at your husband, even if you have problems. You don't need to be talking bad about your spouse ever. You're on the same team. You're on the same, you know, you're one flesh. You may have issues that you need to get resolved with each other, but you ought never to be talking bad about your spouse. And that is an extent is a total shame to be doing that in public and to be letting other people know and, and, and to be going, going on and make, or making fun of your husband. Look, you are there for each other. If you don't have your spouse, who do you have? You know, I mean, that, you are there till death do you part for each other and to provide strength for each other and to be there. Uh, uh, you know, even if everyone else is against you, you ought to have your wife or your husband with you. Amen. One last way that I have written down in my notes is we have a lot of other uh, topics to go into. For a wife to make a husband ashamed would be a wife that's not raising the children properly. A wife that's you know, raising children, maybe they're uneducated. She's not doing a very good job of, of teaching them. Or they're unruly and they're, they're just complete, you know, terrors because they're not receiving the proper discipline, maybe. You know, a lot of times uh, a woman doesn't want to, you know, and 
who doesn't want to mete out the, the proper discipline because they don't want to hear a child cry or whatever. You know, we're going to get into all of that when we, you know, further in the book of Proverbs with the, with the discipline. But the Bible says not to spare for their crying. You know, not to spare the rod, not to, not to um, forgo the, the proper biblical punishment of the spanking because they cry, because, you know, and I've had, we've had different children. Obviously, they're all different. They all have their own personalities. But we had one, one of our children, man, they scream their head off like it's the worst thing. You, you'd think you're like sawing off an arm or something when they get just a swat on the behind. It's like, oh, it's the worst thing in the world. Others haven't dealt the same way. You know, they cry, but it's not, not as bad. But like if your first is just like screaming, just bloody murder, that might, I mean, I could, it could shock you at first. You might think like, what in the world? You know, like I know it doesn't hurt that bad. Right? I know it's not that bad. But you can't spare for that. You can't just think because they're throwing some huge fit that you don't do what's right. But um, I'm not going to get off into the whole child rearing thing. But if you're not raising your children properly, that is a shame. When you, and then when you go out, when you bring out your family in public and your kids are just, just all over the place, and it's, it's shameful to, to not have that. And it's, it's, unfortunately, it's kind of the way things are going these days. When we go out, oftentimes, I'm shocked at, at the, the comments, oh, wow, your children are so well-behaved. And it's not that we're, you know, like we're just some awesome parents. It's just nobody seems to be disciplining their children anymore. And there's so many of them, it's becoming terrors and nightmares. I mean, even not really growing up, and, you know, I was, definitely wasn't saved. My parents weren't saved. It wasn't that abnormal for even you know for a lot of kids in my in my age group to still be relatively well behaved. You know, it was only the really problem families that seemed among my friends and peers that were just really unruly. But these days it seems to be so much more than that. There's just just it's almost commonplace to have children just being extremely unruly, but and that's a shame. That's a shame. And, and when the wife is, is a shame, makes her husband ashamed, it's like rottenness in his bones. And if you want your marriage to last, ladies, you need to look on your own selves to be the virtuous woman. Read Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31 goes all about all the attributes of a hardworking, virtuous woman. And many of the other places, read Ephesians 5, read Colossians 3, read 1 Peter chapter 3, read these, read these, these areas that talk about, the, about um, you know, a woman's role. And a lot, in many cases, it's completely contrary to what the world's teaching and, and what is popular today and, and what is accepted in our culture, but it's God's instruction. And we ought to love the, um, the instruction and not be hating reproof. But let's continue on here. Now, the way that I'm going to deal with kind of the rest of this chapter is slightly different than what I've been doing uh, with, through the book of Proverbs. Normally, we just kind of keep reading verse by verse and, and I'll preach through it. I've categorized these, though, because there's, a lot, there's, there's certain topics that come up, but they're mixed in throughout the chapter. So what I've done is I've grouped them. So we're going to deal with more of like a topical within the chapter and hit all the verses, but hit them kind of out of order. So the first one I've noticed is there's a lot of references to the wicked person. And we've gone over a wicked person in the past, so there's some different attributes in this chapter than we've seen in the past. And again, it's my, it's my strongly held belief that the wicked person... You know, in general, for the vast majority of these verses, is talking about someone who really is wicked, like in their heart. Someone who is like the wolf in sheep's clothing. Someone who's out to do harm to people. Right? Not just your average, you know, unsaved person, but someone who is actually wicked in their heart. That's what this Bible is describing here. We're going to see some of the attributes in the, in the contrast between the righteous and the wicked. So look at verse number five here. The Bible reads, the thoughts of the righteous are right, but the counsels of the wicked are deceit. In verse number six, the words of the wicked are to lie in wait for blood, but the mouth of the upright shall deliver them. The wicked are overthrown and are not, but the house of the righteous shall stand. So these three verses here are obviously all in line. But um, he's talking about the wicked person. It says their counsels, their advice that they give is lies. You, know, you definitely don't want to be getting advice from, from, a, wicked, from a wicked person. 
And it doesn't matter what their position is. You might say, oh, I need to go to a counselor. I need to go to a psychiatrist or psychologist or whatever. If they're a wicked person, like, they're just, you know, it's going to be lies. It's not going to be the truth. That's not someone you want to be going to to get your counsel from, to get advice from. Even, I mean, it may be a family member. Maybe you, you know someone that's close to your family, but they're wicked, and you know that they're wicked. You know that they're not a good person. Don't go to that person for advice. The, verse number six, the words of the wicked are to lie in wait for blood. And I think this is real interesting, the way that this is phrased. It says, the words of the wicked are to lie in wait for blood. Not their actions. We've already seen their actions that the, the wicked person does lie in wait for blood. That they are, you know, setting traps and trying to, trying to trap people. But here it's just referring to their words. That even using their words, they lie in wait for blood. And what, what came to my mind as I was studying this chapter out is what happened with Naboth. Do you remember with Naboth and his vineyard? King Ahab Saw, Naboth's vineyard was right next to Ahab's property. They had properties right next to each other. And of course, in the Old Testament, according to law, the children of Israel, they had inheritance that was given to them. They had landmarks and they had their property outlined. And this is what's given to them. And each family all had their own property. And it was theirs. And it's something that, that, that you know, even if they were to sell it, goes back to them at the year of Jubilee. God was real specific on families retaining their inheritance. And it was a big deal to him to have that. Now, Ahab saw this vineyard. He's like, oh man, I want that. He coveted this vineyard and he really wanted it. So he goes to Naboth and he tries to do it the right way. He says, hey, will you sell me your, your inheritance? And he's like, no. Naboth didn't want to get rid of it. He's like, he's like I'll, give you, I'll give you a better one. I'll give you something. Else, but I want that one right there. Naboth said no. Well, what happened was, you know, Ahab gets all sad and he's depressed because he really wanted this. He had his heart set in his vineyard and he couldn't get it because Naboth said no. Well, Jezebel, his wife, finds out. He says, she's like, well, you're the king. You know, why should anything be withholding from you? She's like, don't worry about it. I'll get it for you. So the plan that she devised was, she said, you know, proclaim Naboth, put him up on high, you know, you know, run him through the town and like everyone will praise him and she set certain men of Belial to bring forth a false witness against him right. and what they did was they lied against him saying that you know he was blaspheming the Lord and he was you know, and totally unrighteously wickedly lying and bearing a false witness against him so that he would be put to death and that's what happened is that these these men conspired together with Jezebel they lied about him and Naboth ended up being executed as a result and then Jezebel goes, see, here you go. Here's that vineyard. Go ahead and take it. And what they did was the wicked, they used their words by bearing false witness to lie and wait for blood. They didn't have to actually physically go and, and kill him, right? They didn't have to go and use their own hands and use their own you know, weapons to take Naboth's life. They did it with their words. They're crafty. They, they're, they're, they're using guile. To, to lie and wait for blood. And that's what the wicked do. Yeah. And you got to be aware of that. Because the wicked aren't always going to be coming at you with, with weapons. Now they very well may. They very well may be set in traps. But they're going to be set in traps in multiple ways. Even their words can be used to cause destruction. It says, but the mouth of the upright shall deliver them. So you ought to be um, one that has an upright mouth to be delivered from that. Now, verse number 7 says, The wicked are overthrown and are not, but the house of the righteous shall stand. Just a real good general overall um, statement there saying, you know what, stay away from the ways of the wicked because they're going to be overthrown. Their ways do not stand. They do not last. They're here today, gone tomorrow. They're going to be taken in their own traps and in their own nets. It says, but the house of the righteous shall stand. You do what's right, God, will be, God is your strength. God is your foundation, and you cannot be moved in that case. Jump down to verse number 12 in Proverbs. The Bible reads, The wicked desireth the net of evil men, but the root of the righteous yieldeth fruit. Now there, again, another interesting verse, wicked desireth the net of evil men. And the way I take this verse to be understood is that they want, the, you know, the evil, evil men have this net, and a net, again, kind of a reference to a trap, to a snare. 
And the wicked desire to have that net, to use that net because they're wicked men. And it says, but the root of the righteous yieldeth fruit. So, um, and then verse 13 says, the wicked is snared by the transgression of his lips, but the just shall come out of trouble. No matter how appealing the way of the wicked might appear just outwardly, you know, if they might have some riches, they might have some things, oh, you know, it may sound fun because they try to entice, the wicked try to entice people by their, um, oh, it'll be a lot of fun. Oh, it's, it's uh, thrilling, right? It's exciting to go out and, and get involved in stealing, get involved in, in taking things from people. You know, Proverbs 1 talks about, you know, cast in your lot among us. You know, we'll all have one purse. We're going we're gonna to get all this spoil. We're going to get all these goods and we'll all share it. We don't even have to work for it. All we got to do is just go take it from people, right? Cast in your lot among us. And they try to entice people into their wicked ways. And the Bible is saying the wicked is snared by the transgression of his lips. See, when they're out there continually trying to cast traps for people and lay wait for blood with their mouth, it's going to come back upon their own head. They end up reaping what they sow and get caught up in their own transgressions out of their own mouth. It says, but the just shall come out of trouble. Look, don't be the one causing trouble. Be the one that God is going to deliver out of trouble. And then in verse 21... A little more wisdom about the, about the evil and wicked person. There shall no evil happen to the just, but the wicked shall be filled with mischief. See, not only do they, do they plan mischief against other people, but it's going to come back their way too. The life of the wicked is not a desirable life to live. That's right. They're always looking over the shoulder. I mean, think about like the gangsters, right? People who are out and literally murdering people. Whether it be the street gangs like the Crips and the Bloods or the, you know, the Al Capone, those gangsters, whatever, whatever gangster you want to you think about in your mind, that is not the lifestyle. You know, it may look glamorous for a snapshot in a second, right? But think about all those guys die young. I mean, almost every single one of them because why? Because they're, they're, they're committing violence against others and then they're always having someone else out for them. The mischief is, is always, you know, they're filled with it. Whether it's them causing it or coming back upon them. It is not, you know, the, 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 what appears to be glamorous for a moment. Oh man, we got all this money. Yeah, but you're going to be dead in a couple years. Right. You know, it's, you, your ways are going to come back on your own head. You will reap what you sow. When you go out violently and take things from people and take lives, it's coming back to you. And then look at verse number 26 of Proverbs 12. The Bible reads, The righteous is more excellent than his neighbor, but the way of the wicked seduceth them. And that's what I've been talking about. They try to seduce you with, with, um, with different ways to, to attract you to do what, get involved with what they're doing, to try to swell their own ranks. But ultimately, the wicked doesn't care about you. They're looking to use you for an advantage. Now, they'll try to seduce you, and that's what you know, the gangsters try to do. They try to see, oh, I'll give you, you know, easy money, real quick money. But that's a way that they could try to distance themselves from having harm come back upon them. And they use these other people. And they don't care if you go down. They don't care if you get killed. They're looking out for themselves. That's all they care about. That's all the wicked ever cares about is themselves. So the wicked attributes that we got from this chapter, they give lying counsel. They have words that bring death. They set evil traps. Their sinful speech is a snare unto themselves. Mischief and trouble come to them, and they are not merciful either. And we're going to see that here. Look at verse number 10. This is the last verse that's kind of grouped into this category of, of the wicked. The Bible reads, A righteous man regardeth the life of his beast, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. Now, this is one, and I think the only clear verse that teaches you that you know you ought not to be abusive to animals. Now, unfortunately, these days people have gone way overboard in their treatment of animals and how they ought to be treated. An animal, but see, we need to keep the right balance and to keep biblical balance on on what an animal is. You know, God has given us animals 
for food, for one. Also for, for you know, help with working, you know, oxen and stuff can help us to, you know, you could utilize animals to help you to get job done. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not like, oh, you're like a slave owner with these oxen and how dare you put them to work for you. No, God has given, that, given us dominion over the earth and over the beasts of the earth, over the animals, to do with as we see fit. And if we you know, if you need to eat, there's nothing wrong with killing an animal and, and, and eating it. You know, and I remember... I've got some, some family members that, uh, like I said, I've mentioned before, I grew up in the, sh in the Chicago suburbs. And, um, you know, there, hunting and doing, you know, there's a lot of things that are foreign to people there. I remember even just having guns. The only people that had guns were, you know, gangbangers and the cops. Like, that's it. Like, like, nobody I knew had guns, at least that I knew of. You know, no, I... It wasn't normal, you know, like, like none of my friends or their parents or, you know, like there was just like no guns around. And when I moved out here, it was like, this is awesome. You know, at first it was a little scary because it's like, whoa, you know, like I went to the grocery store and you see a guy just open carrying and I was just like, man, that's weird. It's weird because I wasn't used to it because it's not anything that I'd been exposed to. When in fact, I mean, there's really nothing weird about it. There's nothing abnormal except it's, you know, norm is determined by, by what you're around, right? Whatever's normal is, is what you're used to. So, but there's nothing wrong with it, obviously. I mean, that's a, I carry a pistol all the time. There's nothing wrong with that. But, <clears throat> so, the first time I went hunting and I, and I, and I shot an elk, you know, there was, um, we took pictures with, you know, I was gutting it and, 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 you know, hanging up and skinning it and stuff. And it's graphic. Right? It's graphic. It's, it's, you see blood, you see guts, you see everything like that. But there's nothing wrong with that. But see, we live in a society where people are like, I can't believe you would do that. How could you do that? It's like, where do you think your meat comes from? <laughs> right? And a lot of times it's, it's, it's just kind of this brainwashing going on and, and people have been so much just, just on this, you know, PETA has just pushed so hard to, to treat beasts and animals as if they're human beings and they're not now look I'm not against having pets and loving your pets and treating your pets well have at it I have pets of my own and we love our pets we take care of them you know we do nice things for them or whatever it's great it's fine but you got to be able to draw the line at the right place you know we live in a world where you have people that you know, for example, with the, with the cop dogs, right, the canines, the canine units, I have seen in comments where, like, you know, the canine unit is used and, you know, some guy's getting his leg bit off by, by this and, and he ends up, like, like, beating it or stabbing it or something because the animal's just viciously attacking him and he's defending himself, right? And... People, you know, like, like sometimes these dogs will die in the line of duty or whatever, and they'll be calling out like, that person needs to be put to death, and all this, you know, that is insane. To say that someone ought to be put to death because the dog died? Or, you know, they'll say the same thing, you know, if someone leaves their dog in the car and it dies from, you know, from the heat or whatever. Now, look, I'm not saying people should do that. You know, I'm not saying it's right. You know, you, you ought to be taking care of your beast, your animal, but it's not justice for you to lose your life over the life of the animal. Let's face it, there's a difference in value of the value of an animal versus the animal or the life of a human being. And this is evident and clear in Scripture. When you see Jesus Christ himself, when the two men met him that were possessed with devils out of the tombs, and you know, remember the story? And the guy says, you know, like, he said, what's your name? He says, my name is Legion, for we are many. And the guy had many devils in him. And he besought him that he, that he wouldn't, you know, cast them out. And he says, well, look, you know, suffer us that we, be, that we go into swine. So Jesus suffered them. And when he cast out the devils, he cast them into the animals, to the swine, to the pigs, that all ran down the hill violently and killed themselves into the ocean. They killed themselves in the water, right? They, they all died. And, and it was, I don't remember how many, it was a lot, right? Because the value of them was, was real high. But that shows you how much 
the value of that one person meant to Jesus Christ way more than the value of all the lives of those swine who they didn't hurt anybody. Why should they have the devil's ego going down? Well, because the value of that man was way more important than the value of those beasts. Amen. Which is why we eat beasts. We eat pig. We eat cow. We, you know, we eat these animals because God has ultimately given them to us. And it's not to say, again, it's not to say there's anything wrong with having a pet and loving your pet, but let's, let's have the proper view and stop treating you know, animals as human beings because they're not human beings. But the Bible clearly teaches here, you know, a righteous man regardeth the life of his beast. And we ought to regard the life of a beast. You ought not to just be real cruel and, 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 and doing weird things to them and, and, and um, you know, torturing them. But it says the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. The wicked person is cruel in their heart. And that's, you know, it's interesting too, if, if you know anything about like psychopaths and serial killers, oftentimes in their past they, they have a history of being extremely cruel to animals before they start turning that on to humans. Of doing really bizarre, sick, twisted things. You know, it's just kind of like, whoa, like what in the world are you doing? You know, you see that happening as a child or even as a young adult or whatever. They, they do these things before they, the, they turn to, to, to people. And that's an, you know, an evidence of the, of the heart of a wicked person because their tender mercies, it says, are cruel. You know, being merciful is supposed to be providing mercy. Like you're, you're letting up. You're not, you're, you're not being hard or harsh on them. But the, the mercies of the wicked are cruel. So that's the, uh, that's the last on the... On the <clears throat> verses on the wicked that are you know, those are all of them in, in the chapter they're kind of geared towards that subject let's move on here look at verse number eight and these verses kind of stand on their own they're not grouped together verse eight and nine excuse me the bible reads a man shall be commended according to his wisdom but he that is of a perverse heart shall be despised he that is despised and hath a servant is better than he that honoreth himself and lacketh bread so the Bible shows us here, you know, man, you're, you're commended or getting, you know, receive accolades or whatever according to your wisdom, being wise. But if you have a perverse heart, you should be despised and, um, and rightfully so, by the way, a perverted heart. He that is of a perverse heart shall be despised. This is talking about people hating someone with a perverted heart. And then verse 9, he that is despised and hath a servant is better than he that honoreth himself and lacketh bread. So they say it's better for you just to be hated, but if you've got a servant, you know, you're obviously a person who has a servant is, is doing well financially. Then it is for you to honor yourself and to be lifted up with pride and be lacking bread. Right? Who cares if you, uh, if you're, if you bring honor unto yourself if you don't, um, if you can't even eat. But, um, Let's, let's move on to our next verse. Look at verse number 11. Now, these next verses we're going to read are all um, under the subject of, of working hard and, and the Bible teaching us to be hard workers. Proverbs 12, verse 11 reads, He that tilleth his land shall be satisfied with bread, but he that followeth vain persons is void of understanding. Verse 14, A man shall be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth, and the recompense of a man's hands shall be rendered unto him. Now, recompense means your reward. It's what you receive of your hands. A man's hands, you will become to you. So the work that you do with your hands, you will receive a reward for that. Just like in verse 11, he that tilleth his land shall be satisfied with bread. You're not going to go hungry when you're, uh, when you're willing to get up, go out, and do the work. It doesn't just happen on its own. And when we've, we have a garden in our, in our backyard. Those plants don't just get there on their own. They need to be maintained. We need to be watching them. We need to be you know, feeding them and watering them and, and pulling off the, the, the big old nasty caterpillars that are trying to destroy all of them and you know, all the different things, the weeds that are popping up. It, it involves work. You need to go out there and, and take care of that stuff if you want to get anything in return. And it says if you do that, you till your land, you're going to be satisfied with bread. You, know, you'll, you make things work. And... Uh, Look at verse number 24. The hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. 
He's saying you don't want to be under tribute and be taxed and, you know, and, and, and be um, under bondage, essentially. Then don't be slothful. Don't be lazy. Hey, be diligent. Get up early. Stay up late. Work hard. And it says you're going to be the one bearing rule. Then you're going to be in charge of your life and um, not being a servant to poverty, to you know, being a debtor and everything else, getting up and working hard. And in verse number 27, the slothful man roasteth not that which he took in hunting. Why? Because he didn't even go out hunting. How is he going to cook anything that, he's, that he took in hunting? Because he's slothful, he's lazy, he didn't even go out. It says, but the substance of a diligent man is precious. And this one speaks to my heart personally because, you know, when you go out hunting, it does require a lot of work. When I, when I go out, you get up early. You get up before dawn. You know, when I go out and hunt elk, it's, you get up really early. You go hike. You're, you know, you're, you're, you're putting forth work. And if you're going to get something, I've, you know, a lot of guys go around, they drive on their little quads and stuff. They don't take game very often because they only get what kind of, you know, they're, they're already scaring them away and they're driving around. If you, I've noticed the people who are the most successful hunters are the ones that are going out and they're hiking and they're hunting and they're stalking and they're, you know, and they're, they're going up and down mountains and they're climbing all over the place and, and they find and will, will receive the substance. And you know what? When you get that game, when you get that, that um, whatever you're hunting, it's precious. And all the, the meat that I've gotten has been very precious because it feeds my family for about a year. And... Um, that's awesome. But the slothful man, the lazy man, it says he roasteth not what he took in hunting. And what is all this, this teaching us? It's teaching you to work hard. It's teaching you, look, if you're willing to get up, if you're willing to till the land, if you're willing to um, receive the recompense of your own hands and be diligent, then you will be satisfied with bread. You will be taken care of. And that's what's wrong with the, with the welfare mentality of the state and the government just taking care of people because it teaches them to be lazy. It says, hey, if you don't have a job, don't worry about it. We'll pay you. you know, we'll help you out and continue to pay you. And what it does is incentivizes people to, to not work because why would you not work when you're collecting this paycheck? Why should I go out and actually work hard when I could not work hard and still get paid? It's a, it's a completely false incentive. The Bible doesn't teach that at all. The Bible says, look, if you, you, know, if you, want, to be a, if you want to be slothful, then you're going to be under tribute. You want to be lazy, you're not going to you know, roast that which you took in hunting. You're not going to be eating. You know, and, and the Bible clearly states in the New Testament, it says, you know, if any man shall not work, neither shall he eat. That's the, the creed that the apostles lived by, saying, look, everyone needs to stay busy and do their own work, work with their own hands, Feed themselves, and if you're not willing to go out and work, then guess what? You're not going to eat because we're not going to take care of you. And obviously, that was, he was, they were talking to able-bodied men. When you have someone who is crippled or is unable and incapable of working for some reason, that's a different story. They could receive alms, and that's righteous, and there's nothing wrong with that with taking care of the people who truly are in need. But if you're a grown man or if you're, if you're capable of doing work, there is no reason for you not to be out there and working. And get off your rear end and, and do something and, um, and, you will, and you don't have to worry about being in need or in want. Let's go to verse number 15. Now we're going to move into the last section here. And there's kind of a few things here. The, the primary uh, topic is going to be our speech and the things that we say. And this was covered already in, in the previous chapter. But um, we're going to look again. Slight differences here in what's being taught. And we're also going to see some, some fool, you know, uh, uh, teachings on fools and, and counsel here in verse 15. The Bible reads, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. Getting, getting good advice is wise, but the fool, they don't need advice, right? The fool says, well, everything I do is right. I don't need anyone to tell me what's right. I don't need instruction. I don't need reproof. I don't need correction. I don't need anyone to tell me what's right. I can think for myself, and I don't need any counsel from anyone. Well, that's foolish. Uh, verse 16, a fool's wrath is presently known, but a prudent man covereth shame. Now, we want to make sure that we're prudent in the, in the way that we um, deal with ourselves, in the way that we present ourselves just in daily life. 
you know, you ought not to be quick to wrath and just make your wrath just evident all the time. You. What this is talking about is a fool's wrath. It's presently known. It's just right away. As soon as the fool gets angry, everyone knows about it. Everyone knows he's full of wrath and kind of flies off the handle. It isn't temperate. Isn't in control of his emotions and of, of, of um, the way he deals with himself. A prudent man is able to cover shame. Is able to, yeah, maybe you get angry, but you can, you can let it slide. You can let things pass because you're in control of yourself. You don't have to just be flying off the handle all the time and be in some hothead that, that everybody just sees that you're a fool. And that, you know, and oftentimes, I've seen this, we've all seen this a bunch, I'm sure, where people just kind of get all upset and crazy and extremely angry over something that's real little. And what do they do? They end up looking like a fool. When you see someone just flipping out and getting real upset, you know, like, you took my parking spot, man! Oh, man, oh, I beat you up because you took my parking spot. It's a parking spot. <laughs> Relax. <laughs> like, really, it's not a big deal. And you know what? That person just looks like an idiot. They look like a fool and you go flying off the handle over something so stupid. And there's many, many things you, I'm sure you could think of that are just really dumb and someone gets super upset over nothing and, and their wrath is just presently known. That's foolish. The prudent man covers shame. Just allow to say, look at verse number 17. He that speaketh truth showeth forth righteousness, but a false witness deceit. There is that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. And again, this kind of ties in with the verse that we saw earlier about the, the wicked that with their words they lie in wait for blood. It's saying here that there, you know, there's people that speak. You know, their words are like the piercings of a sword. It's like you're, you're stabbing someone with a sword, with the damage that you're doing with your words. There's people that speak like that where, where they're literally attacking and, and using their words like a sword. It says, and that's in contrast to the tongue of the wise, is health. Health is doing good for people, you know, being edifying to other people. That basically, you know, if you've got nothing nice to say, don't say it at all, right? I mean, when you just go and, and, um, and just rail on people for no reason and just go and, and use your words to pierce like a sword, that's not, uh, that's not good. It's not righteous. We ought to be able to, to help each other out and use our speech to do so. Verse number 19, the lip of truth shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. Again, the wickedness just, just comes and goes. The lies, they, they last for a moment, and, um, but the, the truth is established forever. Verse 20, deceit is in the heart of them that imagine evil but to the counselors of peace is joy. Jump down to verse number 22. Lying lips are abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are his delight. And we saw this in, um, what was it, Proverbs chapter 6. You know, there's six things the Lord doth hate, yea, seven are abomination unto him. And, and lying lips and a, and a, and a false witness were in, listed in that twice. God really, really hates lying, and we really need to make sure that we are speaking with the lips of truth, that we're speaking, uh, our tongue is, uh, is speaking health, that we're, we're speaking truth and showing forth righteousness, and not speaking lies, not being a false witness, and not having lying lips. Verse 23 says, A prudent man concealeth knowledge, but the heart of fools proclaimeth foolishness. The, the foolish person has no problems letting everybody know that they're a fool. We ought to be wise in the things that we say and temperate and in control and being able to, to, to filter the things that come out of our mouth so that you don't look like a fool. So we don't look like fools, but you can say things rationally and with thought giving to it instead of just speaking off the cusp. And it says, a prudent man concealeth knowledge. There are times to conceal that means to hide knowledge. There's a good time for that. The, the Bible says, you know, Jesus Christ said, you know, cast not your pearls before swine, lest they turn and, and rend you and they trample you. You know, there's times that there's people, it's not even a wise thing to give them knowledge. There are certain people, there are certain wicked people that all they're going to do is just get mad at you and attack you and, and you're not going to do any good to them and you're just going to bring damage upon yourself. There are times when it's wise to conceal your knowledge. 
I mean, even Jesus Christ concealed knowledge when, it, when, when he was asked, why do you speak in parables unto them? Why do you do it? His answer was because, he says, well, unto you, to his disciples, it's given to know these things. You, you, know, you are meant to receive this knowledge. Why? Because they were saved. But these unsaved masses, he says, to them, it's not given. He spoke to them in parables so that seeing they might not see and hearing they might not hear. Like, on purpose, so that they couldn't understand because many of them were reprobate and, he's, and all they would have to do to be saved is to believe. He said, you know what, I'm telling them this stuff so that they don't believe. Because it's not given for them to believe. But that's a whole, that's, a, that's an entire sermon in and of itself. But there is definitely a prudent man there's a time to conceal knowledge. Verse number 25 here, we're almost done, we've got two verses left. Verse 25, heaviness in the heart of man maketh it stoop, but a good word maketh it glad. So this is talking about someone who has a heavy heart, right? They're going through hard times. And it says it makes their heaviness in the heart of man maketh it stoop, but a good word, someone that could bring you a good word, just the, the words out of your mouth can make their heart glad, right? And, and um, that shows you some of the power of our words and, and, and how much of an impact they could have. You could either use it as a piercing sword or you could use it as health and bringing a good word to lift somebody's heart and to lift their spirits when they're going through a really hard time. And then verse number 28, the Bible reads, In the way of righteousness is life, and in the pathway thereof there is no death. So obviously we want to strive to be in the way of righteousness, to know the instruction, to follow that path, to live a righteous life because in that pathway there's no death, right? Sin brings forth death. The path of righteousness does not. There is no death in the path of righteousness. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for these great words of wisdom. Lord, I pray that you please help us to always be receptive to receiving instruction, to receiving correction. Dear Lord, increase our knowledge, increase our wisdom. Help us to, to know more about the things that we ought to do in our life. Lord, I pray that you would please just help the, the wives here to not be rottenness in the bones of their husbands and that the husbands would love their wives and not be bitter against them, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just help us all to, um, to grow closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.